Okay, good evening everybody and welcome to the Princeton Public Library on this chilly December evening. So glad that you all came out despite a little bit of a bite in the air. I'm Janie Herman, the manager of adult programming here at the library and I'm really pleased to welcome everyone to the community room this evening for our second to last in-person author talk of 2023 uh, with our last one actually happening tomorrow night when we'll welcome uh, astrophysicist Joshua Wynn, who will be here to discuss his new book on exoplanets. Now, tonight's author talk, in many ways, could not be more different, as we are here to discuss literary fiction, uh, The Woman Back from Moscow, which is actually a work of historical fiction based upon true events uh, that immerse the reader in the multifaceted history of China's Communist Party through the lens of one woman's life, as we are about to find out. Housekeeping notes before we begin is that the room is equipped with a hearing loop that pairs with T-Coil technology. If you require hearing assistance, you can turn on your T-Coil enabled devices or put up your hand and we will bring you a pair of earphones, headphones. Uh, and also to silence your own electronic devices during the talk and hold your questions and answer until the end when we'll run a microphone around the room so that we can ask questions of our esteemed panelists. Uh, thank you to Labyrinth Books for being here tonight, to be uh, both our event partners as bookseller. Uh, the book signing will take place immediately following the program, and both of our authors will be willing to sign books. Finally, this program was made possible thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities. Our moderator today is Ye Yin Li, a professor of creative writing at Princeton University and director of the university's program in creative writing at the Lewis Center for the Arts. Her works include Wednesday's Child, Where Reason Ends, and Dear Friend, From My Life I Write to You in Your Life. Her work has been translated into more than 20 languages, and she is the recipient of many awards, including the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction in 2022 for her most recent novel, The Book of Goose. Our featured author for tonight, Ha Jin, grew up in mainland China and served in the People's Liberation Army in his teens for five years he left his native China in 1990, no, 1985 to attend Brandeis University. He is the author of eight novels, four story collections, four volumes of poetry, a biography of Li Bai, and a book of essays. He has received the National Book Award for Waiting, two Penn Faulkner Awards, the Penn Hemingway Award, and the Flannery O'Connor Award for Short Fiction. In 2014, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Letters and he is currently professor in the creative writing program at Boston University, and we are so thrilled to have you both here with us this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, I keep saying Janine, Je Jenny. Jamie. Jamie. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you so very <laughs> sorry, Jenny. And thank you all for coming. It's such a cold night, and welcome to Princeton College. Yes, sure. We met 20 years ago, and in San Francisco when you were touring in San Francisco. And so I want to start with the title of the book, The Woman Back from Moscow. I know some of the audience probably are familiar with Srinivas' story, but for those of the readers who have not known the background of this woman back from Moscow, can you give a brief introduction? She was uh, one of the one of the, the children, the so-called the second red generation, because her father was a journalist friend, and also he was kind of revolutionary, and then he was murdered, assassinated, and later she was adopted by by journalist, and she went to Yan, and the red base in Shanxi province. And then she she went to Russia, the Soviet Union, uh, to major in theater arts. It was a very rare a, a specialty at the time because most of the second red generation they would start they studied science, hard science, because their parents really want them to excel in every field. But they didn't. I mean, the second generation really didn't do well. Uh, but she was different. She was one of the best in the arts. 
Um, but again, she was a rarity because uh, very few people studied the, the humanities, uh, the, the arts at the time. And she stayed in, in Russia for seven years and eventually returned to China and became the first woman stage director. And very successful, she directed a, a series of very, very big, impressive plays. In fact, they are pioneer work. And uh, for, for a decade or two, she was viewed as the number one uh, uh, stage director in China. Um, but I think partly also because of her, because of her background, she was so like daughter, so called the Red Princess. And so uh, that, but then because she had known Jiang Qing for a long time, and Jiang Qing, uh, in a way, always had misgivings about her. On the one hand, uh, she is very pretty and more promising. In fact, most successful on stage and on the screen. So Jiang Qing wanted to make good use of her as a partner in helping her produce the uh, revolutionary drama. Uh, but she really doesn't, she doesn't look up to Jiang Qing. In fact, she doesn't look up to anyone. There was kind of deep contempt in her uh, on those powerful people. And so Jiang Qing really became very resentful eventually, and they arrested her. She was killed in jail. Um, so she lived a kind of brief life, uh, died at age 47, quite young, basically at the peak of the, the powers as the, as the artist. And so that's her story. <laughs> I think most people in China know of her story, uh, but uh, how to make all the story, the small details, uh, connected and weave into a, a pattern uh, of drama. So that was my job. Uh, it was interesting, a big challenge. That's why I picked uh, pick her up uh, as a, a topic. How, how did you, when did you start to be fascinated by her story? In fact, I thought, uh, I, I, for a long time, I planned to write about a Chinese woman, contemporary Chinese woman. Uh, I had three choices, um, Zhang Zixi, Lin Zhong, and Sun Yixi. I read all their stories. But the other two, they are in the brave women, very brilliant, powerful, energetic too very rebellious. On the other hand, uh, I felt very depressed after reading their work, <laughs> their stories. Partly because uh, they, they really they are, they are against the Mao, they were against the Mao. I really, they saw Mao had a lot of problems. But on the other hand, I had the feeling that they were like satellites like Wang and Mao. They couldn't get out of the, the, the solar system. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, uh, they really, they, they, Politics became part of their life. So that's why they are, in a way, they are too deeply entrenched in politics. And that really ruined them. And they couldn't get out. But in comparison, she is different. She is a pure artist. She had a deep contempt for power. And all the people like Lin Biao, Liu Alu, all those uh, top generals, top uh, in marshals. And she really, she, she looked down on them. Uh, she was really not interested in any of those. And part of the is because she started at the very top of the, the power echelon. Her, her adoptive father, Zhuge Lai, was the second powerful man, and second uh, most powerful man in China. So she knew what power was like. And she was, she's, she's very different from others. Also, there's a sense of that, that there the pursuit for artistic <laughs> I think I would say, uh, <coughs> try to figure out another way of uh, uh, making revolution in art instead of uh, in ideology and politics. But again, that was a wrong route. And so toward the end, I would say her death, although it was a murderer, 
in a way, there, there was no other choice, no other solution for her. That was her end. Uh, in that uh, social structure, that political regime is impossible to have a pure artistic pursuit. That was taboo, reaction. So I think that's why, in a way, her murder was justified by the revolutionaries at the time. I think the early years of the Cultural Revolution. Right, so it, it's interesting you said the other two women, you know, their entire lives were about politics. Yes. Her life, in a way, was all about politics, too. Yes. Was, are there, or I guess in you, to your mind, were that generation of people, were they ever free from politics? No, it's, but that's, that, that's why there is a kind of a dichotomy between her, in her and also in her husband's. Life. They do believe that even for art, they are supposed to serve the revolution. But on the other hand, she really, she could see there was another kind of pursuit that is equally glorious. So there's another kind of glory, and she tried to pursue that, and that make her different from others. For instance, the other women, in fact, they became illusionary. Uh, uh, for instance, in uh, Lin Zhao, in her late years, she dreamed of herself she was a, a copy <coughs> of another top Chinese official, Ke Qing Shi. Mm -hmm. And she dreamed that Mao, Mao ended Ke Qing Shi, so Mao <coughs> raped her. So that, that pure, that was really madness. And she was really uh, crazed by the political pursuit. But whereas uh, in her case, in Sun Mishin's case, uh, there's always rationality, the purpose. It was very clear. That is, she wants to do art, uh, really pure art. But again, that was really, it's very, it's impossible to separate that from all the revolutionary <laughs> uh, demands. Right. Can you talk a little bit about her marriage? Because I find her marriage quite fascinating. As you said a little, she married one of the top actors sure, yeah. in China, who was a playboy, right? You yeah. know, he slept with people, and he went to North Korea and slept with the yeah. dictator's <coughs> secretary and got that woman executed. Uh, I mean, equally dramatic and story, sure. you know, rich man. So can you give a little, and then I just, I'm curious, what's your interpretation as her staying with the husband? I think he, she really loved him. Uh, I think in one, at one point she said, I love his soul. He was really a very devoted as an artist. One day they produced the, uh, uh, the play, How, How Steel Was Tempered. No, but that is but, uh, based on, it's called Bar, because how he, but, but basically, it is uh, based upon that novel, How Still Was Tempered. And uh, during the rehearsal, he collapsed several times. Uh, he even couldn't stop laughing. Uh, he was, but he was a well-seasoned, a uh, top actor, one of the very best. Uh, but he was so involved. I think she was touched by that. And, uh, uh, of course, he's a very handsome man, but he was a playboy. And, uh, I think that she was fascinated by that, value how they produce uh, plays together, uh, so they got into a, a, a love affair. But at the time, both the man was married to a top actress, family from really is very, very uh, beautiful woman, a uh, northern kind of beauty. Uh, <coughs> so that was outrageous. But that again shows another kind of Another aspect of this woman, the, the, the Harry, as you may, and she basically she she just she she was very clear about what she wanted, and very brave too, very brave, and in fact, in a way, alienated her herself from others. Right. What What do you think she wanted from him? And also, I know she wanted art and pure art from him. Do you think if he really had a soul? 
<laughs> I think for, for him, there is a sense that there's a deep uh -huh. life. That's part of it. Also, I think and she was very beautiful, and she was surrounded by so many silvers. Right. So she, in a way, she had to grab a man quickly. That I had that sense. But perhaps vanity is part of it too, because we know Jin Shan is for many years the number one or number two actors uh, in China. Uh, even some uh, young starlets even, even killed themselves, suicide, because they didn't reciprocate their, their love or affection. And he was, but on the other hand, I think he was changed because because of his her love, he had changed. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed, when he came back from Korea under escort, and uh, everybody, even Zhou Renai, and they basically, everybody urged Sun Wei Shi to abandon, to divorce him. But she said, no, they basically said, this is a forgive. Terrible mistake, but this will be good, it's the last one. That also means, you know, I really still view him as my, my husband. So that saved him. And really, afterward, there was no fair anymore. He did life quite clean. And he became more devoted, both as an artist and as a husband. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so, so clearly, you know, this woman whose face <laughs> is on the cover, and she had a dramatic life, certainly. And how do you, how do you view her? Just, you know, when you were writing this novel, what was the difference between writing a novel and a biography? Because I know you have also written biography. And this partly, you know, it reads very much like a biography. But on the other hand, because mm -hmm. you know, a lot of details in the inner life, right. I had to figure out how to make, make sense, make connection. Mm -hmm. For instance, in his biography, usually uh, there was always a list of the, the drama that plays he, she produced, or she participated in acting. I think in the earliest one is Three Sisters by Chekhov. And, but the, it no, there was no extra information on this. We don't know what, what role they actually play, uh, how active she was in that play, we don't know. But, that, but also we know that for the end, at the very end of her life, there was a big uh, nail hammer into her, into her head, into her skull. skull. So that basically, uh, I dramatically make the connection that I trace to the Chekhovian play, the, her participation in that play, because she learned the phrase in that play from Marsha, the second daughter, because Andrew, the, the, the young man, the son, sold the house which belonged to all the sisters and himself, but he didn't tell others just saw it because he was deep in debt. He was uh, he was drunk all the time. So, but Marsha was uh, said something. You know, I I really this I, I can't get this up in my head. It's a nail driven into my head. I can't mm -hmm. blow up pull it out. So I think she adopt that language. And check out with a big part of it. Uh, I can see check out really uh, in a subtle way shape the mentality. And the artist. Mm -hmm. So toward the end, uh, I assume from uh, in fact, I also there are many moments she used the, the word expression. I can't you know, this bother me so much like a nail. I can't pull it out. <coughs> my head. So that means when he, she was in prison, she must have used the same language. Mm -hmm. And some people, some men, uh, to get an advantage, basically drove a nail into her head. So that kind of connection, that is a novelist of job. You have to find all the small details. Uh, sometimes just one thing, small thing, and then technical thing. You have to only have to figure it out in a fiction way. For instance, I use her name, you may, because it, we can't use Sun Wei Shi in a sentence. That will upset the cadence. But it's very hard, it's very, almost impossible for for native speakers to pronounce that name. So then I, I saw her early on, she, in her, one of her letters to her, her youngest aunt, 
she signed the you me, and I realized that she used this name among her friends and family. So I adopted that name. Uh, mostly in less formal occasion situation, she used that name. That made the narration easier. So there are a lot of sl sl small problems, technical problems, belong to fiction. So I have to figure out how to resolve them. So that's the difference. And, uh, and can, can you talk a little bit about the research you have done? I know you said you couldn't find the performance or performance. Did you see anything? I know there are a lot of photos reproduced. Sure, yeah. I, 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 you know, the, the beauty is nowadays the internet. So I did see some uh, reproductions for early oh, plays. Oh, wow. okay. And also I, uh, I bought an, uh, a, a good number of plays, uh, including her reproduction. On the early version of Uncle Tom's Cabin and some uh, other plays. And, and also, uh, she was educated in, in, in Russia, uh, in the Russian theater, Russian Institute of Theater Arts in Moscow. And so there are books written by her teachers. So I, I, I basically, I had, by reading those, I, I, I had a sense of the, how the plays were produced. Mm. And uh, later, I think I got more involved because I felt suddenly I realized that theater production uh, can be a topic, can be a fiction topic. And very few people have, had written about that. So I began to, to write it. So the chap there'll be more, there, will, there will be more chapters, one after another, so the book gets bigger and fatter. But I got excited, got, in a way, got carried away. Uh, I, I feel that uh, uh, that was an interesting topic, just to see how a play was produced. And, you know, speaking of research, I came in, <coughs> I opened the book, the first chapter, there was the main character, Yu Mei, and Jiang Qing, Madame Mao, they were actually fighting for a man. Mm -hmm. And I saw the man's name. That man actually was my grand uncle. <laughs> <laughs> that was really uh, her first lover. Uh, <laughs> I did not yeah. know that. Okay, I knew Jiang Qing and my grand uncle had an affair. I did not know that <laughs> <laughs> Sun Li Shi was also part of the yeah, love triangle. I think, yes, and uh, <laughs> Sun Li Shi, I think he prefers Sun Li Shi, but Jiang Qing, because she moved in with Mao, mm -hmm. uh, so so he <laughs> went and go back out, back out. <laughs> back out. Uh, and even even she, I think even she backed up later on in, in the Cultural Revolution. He got persecuted by by Jiang Qing. It's it's interesting how politics and history sure. affect people's lives. So my grand uncle. <laughs> yeah. Was a, was, a, was a communist when he was 14. Sure, he, yeah. was a, he was the youngest Chinese Communist Party members in Moscow. And he was educated in Moscow. He came home, became the... the, the, the yeah, the, there was a group was called the 28 and a half um, Bolsheviks. Yes. So your grand uncle was the, the half, half. <laughs> was the youngest, the, the, the half. Um, but he was very smart, very intelligent uh, at the time. He served as an interpreter, Russian interpreter for Mao and Zhou Enlai. Yes. So he was trusted. Later, in fact, he was very active. He was uh, an ambassador to uh, Albania. It's a major country for China. <laughs> he, was, he was ambassador to Albania and then to Denmark. And uh, was, uh, <laughs> uh, Syria, I think. And, so. yeah, yeah, Syria. Uh, yeah. And, but well, the funny thing was, of course, I did not know his story. I did not know his involvement was this woman. I only knew his involvement was uh, Madame Mao. Mm -hmm. And our family legend was because he was, you know, an early lover of Madame Mao, he didn't get persecuted during the Cultural Revolution. He got the persecuted. In, in, he, fact. in fact, yeah. yeah he was a the, vice minister, a foreign minister. But somehow he lost his job without a reason. Oh yes, I he know. just he just uh, apparently <laughs> there were forces <laughs> against him. Except he didn't die. I mean, when we sure, left in yeah. Beijing, when I when I was little, my grandfather used to take us to his family. And one thing I remembered was this was in the early 1970s. 
my, my sister and I had never seen chocolate in our life. And we go to his house, yeah. it's chocolate, it's like the size of pencil box and books <laughs> lying everywhere. Yeah. They're not even eating them. Yeah. It's just extraordinary. Sure. Just, you know, you don't need a you know. and four minster. That's a high, very high, very, very uh, yeah. position. But I, I want to, you know, just using that as an example of how politics and history and our daily life, everyday life, sure. you are in the world. Yes. Yeah, that's you why, for instance, in, about, you yeah. know, your grand uncle's oh God, <laughs> case, you know, he, in fact, he really, his, he, he's more interested in you, May. And in fact, even Wikipedia always, often listens to him as the first number. Oh, wow, I've never uh, I, <laughs> but, but I think because of Jiang Qing basically and um, all the, they got together. So Jiang Qing moved in as his life secretary. Mm -hmm. And so your grand uncle backed out. Mm -hmm. Really, very clearly. Very the next year he married another woman. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so uh, that kind of decision, uh, apparently it's political, very, very political. Mm -hmm. How long have you spent on this book? It's a very big novel. Okay, maybe yeah. four years. Oh wow! Yeah. In the quick, you know, because I, you know, I, I because I, I the, the theater chapters, mm -hmm. uh, I watch the play and try to imagine, so I, I could write the chapter uh, rather quickly. Mm -hmm. So there were several chapters were written like that. But originally it was I planned to write a much smaller book. But because those uh, uh, plates got in, right. so they got bigger. Right. Did it surprise you? Did, when you when you worked through this, did anything surprise you after you finished the novel? Uh, yes, mm. yes. I think that the the way, the major part, the big surprise is that, in fact, the Soviet, the Soviets, the Russians, they were extremely generous to the Chinese communists. Really? Very generous. Mm. Uh, with very few exceptions, all the top of Chinese officials' children were sent to, to Russia. And at the time, uh, I, I, as I mentioned, basically there was an intention to make the, the second red generation excel in every field, the best in every field, even in sports. You know, they, they have a few athletes really try to make them the best athletes. I think there was one young girl, later she was known Li Keke. She performed uh, uneven bars on the Red Square when Stalin was <laughs> reviewing the parade. So there was really the, the, the Chinese top officials' children were treated extremely well, well protected. Zhou Lai, uh, in fact, had a negotiation. Zhou uh, Lai said these young kids are the blood bloodlines of the, our comrades, and so they must not be sent to the front. So none of the children were sent to the front except the Mao's son. Mao Ai Ying, that's the only that's one. A, that's, a, that's a Korean war, but, but I think... No, he, he also went to, went to uh, Poland oh, yes. as an artillery oh. <laughs> uh, lieutenant. Okay, yeah. So, so I mean, most of these, uh, the second generation Red Youth, they grew up in Moscow. And, but then, you know, World War II happened. Right? Yes. yes. Yeah. But they wanted to fight, but they were not allowed. And what did they do there? I, I was fascinated by this little big school where all these, you know, Yeah, they moved the to a, 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 a textile town called Ivano. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the Chinese kids would, would stand there in, the, in, the, in a big compound. And, but they were well protected. There are movies and books written on this. And in fact, even just the 10 years ago, a lot of the old people, Chinese, uh, people who return to that place because they grew up in, the, in, in that kind of a home, a children's home. Wow, okay, yeah. So, and I wonder, I, I want to ask about the, the other book you wrote, the biography of Levi, mm -hmm. the poet. And, you know, this is, 
like your your trajectory, your career trajectory. Can we talk a little bit about that? You've you've been writing fiction, po you've been you started poetry with poetry, sure. yeah. and then you <coughs> move into short stories and then novels, and then you turn into history. Is that your fascination? Where your fascination mm -hmm. is? These no, days? no, no, no. Yeah. This is no. And in fact, in a way, a, a book like this, in a way. Uh, really, I want to write a novel uh, in, in the convention of the Anna Karenina. But for a story of, like, of that kind, it, it, you need a platform. At least you need a beautiful woman. Mm. First, a mm. <laughs> very spirited, right? mm. intelligent woman. So, mm. that's, so that, in a way, it is still kind of literary pursuit. Mm. But the bad book it, it is pure nonfiction. That's different. Because my wife has been sick for a long time. And for several years, I couldn't write a novel because when you write a novel, you have to immerse yourself in the project. You have to think about it day and night, uh, but I couldn't do that. But Li Bai, because he is there, and so by chance, I was asked to write a long article. Then I couldn't find a real uh, biography of, of Li Bai in English. So I realized instead of writing a biographical essay, maybe I should just write a full biography. So that's how it started. Mm. But it is not different from a novel. But nonfiction, the way of life is there. Basically, I basically I, I view his life as different components. So different parts, I just focus on individual parts. I follow the poems. So it, in a way, it wasn't like a routine work. Mm. Um, but but I was surprised that um, the book was when it was done, so it was accepted the right way. Uh, because the editor he said, you know, imagine that uh, Li Bai was in the seventh century, eighth century, and Chaucer in the <laughs> you know, many hundred years later. But how how can you write a a, a biography of the Chaucer nowadays? Mm -hmm. It's hard to so give you this as a, Hard, really hard research, hard work. But but in, in a way, they really. But my editor said clearly at the time that I don't want a scholarly work. I just wanted a book for generator, mass market. But on the other hand, I noticed a, a series of books written by a, a great scholar, Karen Strong. So he wrote books like Buddha, Islam. Uh, <laughs> all these topic and the historical figure, they are small book, in fact, less than 400 pages long, but they were classics. So I wanted to write a book in that convention. Uh, scholarly, it's sound. At the same time, uh, it's readable. Everybody can read it. Mm -hmm. So that's why that book came into existence. Right, I found it fascinating. You were following his poems when you were writing his yes. biography, yeah. and here you were really following her. Draw, uh, you know, plays, yes, the, the yeah. play production to write about her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. In, yeah. in a way, yes. I, I was fascinated by all the plays, mm -hmm. uh, especially the first and last play she produced. But again, it became because I ran into another kind, became another kind of revolutionary model play. I right, ran right into Jiang Qing's project. Right, right. So that also contributed to her end. Mm -hmm. But it was a fascinating project as an artist, that no matter what, she always somehow uh, outside others. Right. <laughs> you know, in a way, I think this novel is a, it's, it's a, it's a warfare between two women, you know, two yes. beautiful women. Yes. One is more beautiful, more talented, mm -hmm. and, and yet, in the end, less powerful. Sure. Right? Yeah. She, on the hand, she's not in, interested in power. She is, uh, she's somehow naive in many ways that she's naive. Yeah, I, I, can we just go back to that she was not interested in power? Mm -hmm. and I find that fascinating because she grew up among the most powerful men yes. uh, in China. Yes, and you see, the reason why I said that is because there were really powerful men who basically, they would marry her at any time. For instance, when she said in Russia, when she was returning to uh, to to China uh, by the way by way of Harbin, mm -hmm. uh, Lin Biao yes. was there as the commander of all the right. troops in Manchuria in the northeast. 
Limbio heard that she was coming back. Basically, she wants to break up, you know, to break up his marriage. Yeah. And she said, <laughs> basically, uh, I promised to marry her. I was supposed to marry her. Mm -hmm. And so she's that kind of figure. I really that disturbed a lot of long men around, around her. <laughs> and so, in other words, if she's interested in power, she has infinite opportunities. Right. <laughs> Very interesting because then he, you know, she had all the opportunities, but she also had the contempt for power. Yes, <laughs> and I find that's one yeah. of the most fascinating, you know, aspect of her character. Yes, and what are you working on now after this novel? <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. writing some poems because I'm teaching poetry writing this mm -hmm. semester. Our, our poet Robert Kinsky is on leave. He's about to retire, and so this year, next year, I'll be teaching library uh, poetry writing. So, as I mean, doing that, uh, I, I'll be writing a lot of poems. Yes. So we'll see a collection of poetry from you soon. I, I don't know because you know in China we have the uh, the study of running away. So <laughs> that's my that's my my poetry writing topic. <laughs> Fabulous. about the immigration migration. Right, right. I, I know, I should, I should, I'm looking at that. So I think we should open up for the, for the audience to ask you a question. You know, in fact, you, you, you should ask her questions. No, because no, I, I was told, I was told this would be a conversation with between no, uh, you and me. No, it's about so. your <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, we can have questions for both, though. So um, are there questions for? Um, our panelists? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Any questions? Oh, right here. Yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned about chocolate and uh, mm -hmm. some leadership. Uh, we happen to have lived in China, mm -hmm. and it seems that uh, there is two, a parallel system mm -hmm. with access to goods and services to the elite, mm -hmm. as well as, like, for example, news, for example, like Central Shaoxi. Yeah, right. it's, uh, it's for the elite and then the rest of the people. Yeah. This is the common. But there, I have two questions in, from the historical point of view, because I haven't read the book, so I cannot discuss the, the book itself. One is, you mentioned that the actor was a playboy. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, with my little understanding of China at that time in the 50s and 60s, I can't imagine somebody being openly a playboy instead of going Gao uh, instead of making the revolution. Yeah. There is a dissonance between the, his behavior he and, and the propaganda <laughs> and everything. That's my first question. Yeah. My second question very quickly again. Uh, since she is the, uh, Sumatra, she's the daughter, or adopted daughter of John Lai. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So how could John Lai was not able to save her since she died in the early years of the yeah. revolution? Okay. And John Lai has enough power to be able to save her, it seems to me. Absolutely, yes. Okay, let me answer the last one first. And uh, John Lai, in fact, she signed the, the, the rest of the warrant. <coughs> he signed it. Because Yang Qing went to him and demanded that he cooperate with her. So basically, he signed it. That was a really huge strain on his life. If, as a father, how could he do that? But he also signed the arrest uh, permission for his own brother. Yes. Along with his yes. adopted daughter. Yes. You could several say others. Several yeah. others, yes. all very close to him. So you could argue that he actually he's sacrificed really, That's why I said people. he's a political animal. Yeah. For power, he would do anything. And in fact, in the case of his, his younger brother, he provide names, address, all, <coughs> all the detailed information on these people. In a way, it is, yes, yes. And because Jiang Qing was so powerful, he couldn't afford to alienate her. And to answer the first question, and Jin Xiang, <coughs> Jin Xiang he, he was famous in his 30s, in the 30s, 1930s, before the revolution. And so for many years, he was really very top, very top actor and in the old China. But after, but at the same time, the heads of Iron, at the same time, he was a communist agent in the national <laughs> nationalist government. So he was one of the top, the biggest 
No. Uh, uh, in, in the old regime, so people couldn't accept him right, after the, uh, at the re liberation. But that's another way to show he was really a, a good artist. And he was eager to return to theater and uh, cinema because he was a top agent uh, serving the party for so many years. He could get a powerful position, but he was not interested in any of those. Uh, he just wanted to return to the stage. And he was appointed to the uh, vice chairman of the youth experiment theater. People would not accept him. So the leaders had to go to the theater and explain, this is the, the biggest spot we have. <laughs> so, uh, but later, once he became a, a, a really a cadre, uh, he, he was not that uh, uh, outrageous, especially. But still, we talk about you know, his uh, uh, success with women, with others. And again, the biggest mistake was when he went to career, he was in charge of shooting a movie. Uh, and he basically he openly lived together with a woman uh, who was supposed to be Jin Yisheng, uh, you know, the, the Korean top leader's secretary. So the woman was, was shot by fire squad. squad. And, but he was stepped back. He was supposed to, and I was so angry, he wanted to kill him. And, but and by the, his wife said he should basically save him. Uh, I think that really changed him. <laughs> After a woman was executed <laughs> for him. So that's why you know, that's why a lot of people said, you know, this is an international scandal. So you, you treat the woman so harshly so the man should is equally responsible. <laughs> so so basically really uh, he was lucky he was not killed by by the but Chinese uh, communists. Yes, I think we could say Chinese history didn't treat women very nicely. <laughs> That's true. That's right. very true. Right. Yes. Right. Very true. Yeah, I, I just want to add one comment about when you asked why Zhou Enlai signed his own adopted daughter's you know, arrest. I thought it was interesting, I'm sure some of us had the same experience. We grew up thinking he was the only saint in the world. Yes. You know, like, you know we grew up, like, he was a saint. He was just, just a, yeah, impeccable, like a flawless man. If there were ever a flawless man, it was that man. It turned out he was as, you yeah. know, Hodgkin said, he was a political animal. He did all these things. And also he murdered a lot of people. He murdered a, he, a lot of people. He assassinated families, you know, yeah. in, in young children in Shanghai when he was uh, He's a own benefactor. Yeah, yeah. So. But I, I'm sorry, but at the same time when he died, and during the eight, uh, at April for the speaking the tomb, right. there was a whole. Right. Yes. Right. That was the there beginning. Was, see, that's yeah. why the people. Yeah. Are people to so, yes. yes. Yeah. See, the, I think people, uh, people were, were, yes, people were brainwashed. Mm -hmm. So that's the yes. propaganda. So, so powerful. Really, people believe in that. Still nowadays, you can't say openly anything against the Jordan Right. Mm -hmm. Well, brainwashing is a very good <laughs> word <laughs> for our history. I think there's. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, my name is Su Ling. I just read Dr. Hardin's two books, the collection of Michelle stories and another novel, The Bold Rocker. And I checked out these books from the library. So I really love your books and the stories. It's a really pleasure to hearing from you talking about your research and the writing process face to face here. I have two questions. Uh, first is uh, because I'm also a writer, an amateur writer, uh, so I'm very interested in how you transfer from thinking, writing, and reading in Chinese into reading and writing in English. Because these are two totally different languages, yeah. the way you think, the way you express your feelings are totally different. So. Uh, how, when you create your novels, did you think in Chinese first, or did you write in Chinese first and translate it into English, or do you formulate those ideas in your brain already in English? That's my first question. 
Um, my second question is when I read your stories, I noticed that the communist China is a big part of your stories. It's like a, a big theme of your stories. I think that that's very brave for you to explore this. On the other hand, I also think, well, being Chinese, I know communist China, of course, shaped our way of viewing the world, our relationship with the others. But I also feel we are multidimensional. We are more yeah, than sure. the background of communist China. Yeah. I'm wondering, like, uh, because for writers in China, it's almost impossible for them to write from that angle for communist China. But being a writer in U.S., you have this freedom to write about communist China. But do you feel that if we don't write about communist China, we are, if we write about the other dimensions of Chinese people, uh, will the American market or American readers interested in that? Sure. You see, That's uh, my two you, questions. You, Thank you. In fact, uh, even many of the folks, in fact, not about, about, about politics, but about common people, it is entirely possible. Mm -hmm. But the way, in fact, in the book you mentioned, uh, my books, and those books, I think they were earlier books. And in a way, I still haven't left the China side psychologically. Uh, so politics is part of uh, our life. There's no way you can separate a character from politics. That's the fabric of every person's <laughs> existence. Even now, I think, in, in, in our lives, uh, politics is still part of it. Um, but what you said is right. Whether we can write it purely from a, a person, a, a personal angle. Uh, that is fine, especially by young immigrants, right? Young migrants. Uh, that is, uh, in fact, that can be universal. I do. I think if the story is written well, and everybody can appreciate it. It doesn't matter whether uh, American readers or other readers, as long as the story is well told. You, you get all the complexity and subtleties out of it. And so I, I think that, that is a thing. But again, it needs a lot, a lot of effort to, to do that. In a way, uh, for many years, I, I have been kind of obsessed. That is, I noticed, I noticed there are so many holes in, in Chinese, contemporary Chinese history, which there are so many great events, horrendous events that are not reflected in, in the literature. So in other words, if we look at this period two years from, 200 years later, it might be a, a blank, blank landscape. So that's why I was fascinated. There are something, in fact, there are some big holes. We can buy however, maybe we can make it even less empty. So I, I began to believe, in other words, in China, it used to be most writers used to believe uh, they couldn't write well, and their work was not well received because they didn't have the skill. How to write was the big challenge. But I began to change it. Uh, I, I used to think that, like that too. Uh, later, I began to change it. I think to write, what to write is also a technique. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Because it shows an attitude. <laughs> uh, so, and I think that is an important part. Uh, a lot of the Chinese, uh, the, uh, the Chinese writers have been deprived of that, uh, basically, a technique. All right, can I, can I ask you a question? Um, yeah, th thank you, Professor Jin, right? So, uh, for uh, writing this book. Um, I have a lots of questions, to be honest, but certainly I will not ask you. I will ask you one. But, but before I ask you one, can I ask you, Professor oh, Lee, right? Yes. So who's, who's your great, yeah. great, great grand uncle? What was his name? My grand uncle, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was she? Oh, she's. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So for you, uh, my question for you, uh, I think you mentioned that for the American publishers, they have less interest to publish China stories or yeah. Chinese stories That's true. here, right? So on the one side, your book is still published here, 
-hmm. If back in China, mm -hmm. mainland China, there's no way to publish, right? True. So that's certainly a good thing. Mm -hmm. On the other side, so here's my question. Um, what, 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 what are those reasons you think like, American publishers have less interest in publishing China or, or Chinese-related um, books? I think there is a, a, a effort you know, kind of against Chinese culture influence. That's clear. I re recently I ran into a poet uh, who has been translating Tianjin, you know, the, the, the chairman of the Writer Association in China. He said, you know, the books I I, I finished a lot ago. Nobody would read it. And just he you know, said the whole publishing industry is against the China now. And in a way, there is a grain of truth in the statement. Because in, in case of Tianjin, she's a top a national leader, right? Uh, imagine as a writer, uh, it's like, a, a, like a, a state secretary, secretary of state, that kind of rank in China. Because we know that she is uh, like a vice premier, they call it Fu Guoji, a very, very high ranking official. That means if her book is accepted, that there will be enough funding for it. But even with funding, no publisher sure will touch it. So that, that, that's the situation. And in fact, I think that that's the problem. Now, for instance, in this case, I, I talk about while I was working on it, I was carried away by all the theater, the, the play productions. On the other hand, uh, I, I knew, intuitively I knew I, I got into trouble. Because if the book was too big, it would be expensive to produce. So nobody would touch it. In fact, literally nobody would read it. Because I have another two books accepted by a publisher. The publisher could not decide which one to publish. So, But I had a note in my proposal. I mentioned this book. It's about a woman stage director educated in, in, in Moscow uh, about her life. And she said, let's take a look at that. At that time, the book at that stage was like eight, more than 800 pages long. Nobody would read it because it would be too expensive to produce. And so, also because it's a Chinese topic. OK, so, so, so you think it's, uh, it's really because of the economics? Because there's no? No, no, culturally, too. Because for, uh, the other example, but I'm lucky because the publisher read it, it began to read it. Third with readers, he said, you know, this book reminds me of Anna Karenina. Let's publish this first. So I was lucky. But at the same time, there is a, a, a Korean American writer, uh, Alexander Chi. He wrote a book, a big novel. It's called the, the, the Queen of the Night, about an opera singer, a French opera singer. She's involved with the German Nazis, too. And he wrote a paragraph, just one paragraph. He sold the book right away. And before that, he wrote another book called Edinburgh. He couldn't sell it. Nobody would buy it. But because of the topic of French opera uh, related to Western history, he sold it. He sold it you know, just in one paragraph. And he said he got nine times more advanced than his first novel. And so that's the difference. But on the other hand, you, you, uh, failure and, uh, and uh, that's part of your, the process. You have to accept it as a, a possibility. And so it doesn't matter. I think I, think I have written long ago, as long as the book is well written, somebody will publish it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Whether a, a, a small publisher or big publisher, it doesn't matter. Somebody definitely will publish it. I have follow-up question, right? Oh. So in terms of the book, right, published, circulated overseas, outside China. So who are your major audience? Is that primarily, you know, the immigrant Chinese overseas or the combination 50-50 of I don't have that. I don't have a concrete sense of audience. In fact, that's why I said as long as the book is well written, somebody will read it, somebody will publish it. I think because I started as a poet, 
uphold the uh, basic, very basic principle is that you don't think for audience, mm. right? <laughs> <laughs> because you don't have this is the courage, the courage to speak to emptiness. Basically, the assumption that its work is well done, it will find some kind of audience. So that's basically as a poet's start. Uh, so I don't have a strong sense of uh, audience. That can be illusional because because you don't know who who really will like it in your, your work or not. But the problem, I think the, the important part is you have a sense of what is good in the area, in the topic, in the style, what is the best work, how can you, is your work close to that? Uh, usually, you know, I always tell my students, you have, must have the illusion of greatness. Uh, or just deceive yourself. Once you finish this book, you'll be a great writer. But of course, maybe the book is just a mediocre. But you have to have some kind of vision in order to continue. So that's, that's again, kind of psychology in, in writing. And I, I, for practical reason, in fact, I, when I was taking, I was a graduate student, I was taking class with the late Israeli writer, Ira Epperfeld. He basically he urged us, whenever you write, you must read an old Asian book, a great Asian book. Basically, you, you're supposed to borrow strength, energy from it. I think that's another dimension, that is the science of audience. Imagine behind every great book, how many readers behind it, the best readers, permanent readers. So by getting close to that work, makes you, by luck you might reach some of the readers of the, that great book. So that's why uh, we can't think of the audience in a concrete sense. It's very, it's impossible. Thank you. So I think we're um, at about the, our time. So um, as I said, uh, we are fortunate that we have lavish books here. We have copies of The Women Bas Back from Moscow, as well as Waiting. And we also have Wednesday's Child and The Book of Goose. Books do make a great holiday gift, and it is the, we call it the gift of books here at the library. So uh, I know both of our uh, authors tonight would be happy to sign books. So uh, let's give them a round of applause for this fascinating conversation. Uh, I certainly learned uh, some new things tonight that I didn't know about, and that was really great to have both of you here tonight to help close out our author season. And uh, be on the lookout for 2024. Uh, the library and labyrinth have been uh, collaborating together. We have a really great series lined up starting again in January. But you can come back tomorrow night to learn about exoplanets. You know, just in case you want to do something different. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. And thank you again to both of you. Thank you.